Um, I'm Andrew, for those who don't know. I'm another one of the um, ministers here. We both uh, share the same name to make it as simple as possible for you. Um, a special welcome if you're joining us online. Um, so th- I've got a question for the children. Uh, this, the, the aim of this service is to be all age. Now, some people hear all age and think children, which isn't true. Well, I hope this will be an all age service, but I'm going to start with a question for the children, which is I'm going to start with a, a relatively easy one. Who can tell me what special day it is today? Oh, straight up, yes. Easter day. Easter day, that's spot on. And for bonus point, can you or your sister tell me what we celebrate at Easter? Yeah. Oh, 10 points. Uh, when Jesus rose from the dead. Now, I'm a big fan of um, stories, all kinds of stories. My, one of my favorite stories for a long time has been um, the Gruffalo. Who's got a favorite story? Yeah, we, lots of us enjoy good stories. The reason I think we love stories is because actually our lives are like stories. So they have a beginning and they're heading somewhere. We don't know exactly how the story is going to end at this stage. And also, the world's history is a story. So it has a beginning. God made the world. It has an end. We're heading somewhere when God will wrap things up again. So we love stories because we're in a story. Now, the best stories, I've given away one of my favorites, but you, pro- probably your favorite story as well has probably got a happy ending. The best stories often do. And the reason Easter is such a wonderful day to be celebrating today is because it confirms for us that the history of the world is heading somewhere and it has a happy ending. This world is not going to be uh, abandoned, wrapped up and thrown in the bin. This world has a glorious future because Jesus came out of the tomb. We're going to be thinking exactly why that is in a bit. It's, um, it's to do with our theme verse, which I'll read again. Um, and then we will sing and we'll think a little bit a bit more about this. So the theme verse, it's on the front of your sheet, is this. Christ has been raised from the dead. That's what we're celebrating at Easter. And then it says, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So it's saying that what Jesus did has an implication for us, the first fruits of what's going to follow. We're going to be thinking about that. But first, we're going to sing. And our next song talks about how Jesus um, fulfilled God's salvation plan uh, on Easter Day. So God has a story. It's mapped out. And Easter Day confirmed where the end of the story is heading. Let's stand and let's sing together.
do grab a seat. Um, if you were with us for our Jesus, a Skeptics Guide week, which we had um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we were spending two weeks focusing on a very, very important chapter in the Bible, all about Jesus' resurrection, John chapter 20. And we looked at the middle section of John 20, we looked at the end section, and today we're coming around and filling in the gap. We're looking at the first 10 verses of John 20. And we're going to have our reading now. It's a dramatized reading. You can follow it. It'll be up on the screen or on the inside of your sheet. Or if you're not a reader, uh, you might just want to watch because it's going to be kind of dramatized a little bit in front of us as well. So let me read. John chapter 20 and verse 1. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going towards the tomb. Both of them were running together. <laughs> but the other disciple outran Peter. <laughs> and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. And um, thank you, actors. And um, do keep that open. Um, we're going to be looking at that. We're going to have two talks today, double the fun. And we're going to be thinking about two different things. Firstly, how the empty tomb tells us, number one, that Jesus is alive, then we're going to have a break and we'll sing, and then we're going to think about how the empty tomb tells us that the story of the world will end well. So let's do number one first. The story of uh, the empty tomb tells us Jesus is alive. Now, I'm not expecting many hands to go up, but I'm going to ask this question just in case. Has anybody ever seen someone rise from the dead? No, there's zero hands up, not even children who think it would be nice to answer a question, put up their hands at this stage. Um, a, lot of, a lot of us possibly have seen people who have just died. Uh, I've seen a few. In fact, I've tried on occasions to resuscitate them uh, unsuccessfully. Um, so I've seen people who have just died, but I've never seen people come in the other direction. Uh, someone who has come back from the grave. And once someone is really dead, once someone is obviously dead, confirmed dead by experts, once they're buried in a tomb, like Jesus was, we all know, don't we, that ordinarily dead people don't rise. That's a sad fact of life. And actually, it's worth thinking about this because the people in Jesus' day were no different from us. They knew the facts of life. They knew that Jesus, sorry, they knew that dead people don't ordinarily like, rise. They're not, they weren't stupid. Uh, they weren't gullible back in Jesus' day. But something extraordinary happened on that first Easter day to convince them this is real. Jesus really is alive. And it's worth us, I think, thinking for a moment, what might it take for us to be convinced that someone had come back from the grave? Because whatever that thing is for us, it, something on that level definitely happened to convince these people. Now, children, can you tell me what this is? And I've got a clue on the screen, if for those are at the back. Can, can someone put a hand up? Yes. It is a magnifying glass, and for a bonus, you or your brother, can you tell me who would ordinarily use one of these as part of their day-to-day -day job? Detective, spot on, 10 points. Um, someone like this, probably. Detectives um, use one of these. Um, and uh, children, what we're gonna do now is we, each of us, are going to be detectives just for a little while we're going to look at some of the clues look at the evidence which convince those first disciples that Jesus really is alive 
Now, you might be able to think of some things that convince them. Ordinarily, if I'm talking about this, I, I tend to jump onto this sort of moment. Um, so, children, what, is, what roughly is happening in this picture? Yeah, uh, actually, I'm going to pause because you're a great answer. I might come back to you if I don't get another one. But did you have a hand up? No? Yeah, I'm going to come back. <laughs> Yes, Jesus is showing his disciples that he has holes in his hands. That's what those little red dots are trying to show. So Jesus made these appearances after he came back from the grave to convince his disciples. He does it later, actually, in John 20. He appears to Mary, and she, she hugs him. She won't, doesn't want to let him go. He, does, he appears in a locked room a little bit later to a whole bunch of his disciples and says exactly what you're saying. Come and put your hands in my side where the spear went or in my hands. And you can, you can see that I, the same one who had these scars up on the cross, I'm the one who's come out of the grave. So definitely that's one of the key bits of evidence. That's number one, that Jesus appeared to lots of people, including his disciples there. Sometimes I jump ahead to another bit of evidence, which is really important, which is that the disciples got radically changed. They, they became different kind of people after this event. And actually, this gospel draws this out because only two days before this, Jesus' disciples had fled. They'd left him. They'd deserted their king out of fear. And even now, in, in John 20, they were meeting in a locked room. And they were in a locked room because they were worried that what had happened to Jesus being killed might happen to them. They were terrified. But within just a few weeks of this moment, what we're going to see as we go on in the Bible is that they appear in the middle of the city telling anyone who will listen, Jesus is alive, something's changed. And they were actually ready, many of them, to go to their deaths rather than go back on their story. And that's a really important bit of a clue for us, bit of evidence. Not only did Jesus appear, but the people he appeared to were completely and radically changed. Their whole lives went in a different direction. Now, I'm just going to say a word to uh, some of the grown-ups, if I may, on this same point. And I, I just wanted to underline how, and um, personally, I've been very impressed by this particular strand of the evidence over the last couple of years. Um, so I read uh, this book over the last couple of weeks, The Air We Breathe by Glenn Scrivener, and uh, we had as a book of the term not so long ago, Tom Holland's book, Dominion. And both those books have the same argument, and they describe how it is that the Jesus revolution has completely transformed our world. And what they do is they show the values of the ancient world into which Jesus came, just uh, values of, of cruelty and brutality. And then they show that the values that we just take for granted today, especially in the West, values like equality and compassion and consent and freedom, which we just think are obvious. But all these values have come to us from Jesus and from nowhere else. And those books are historical arguments to try and make that case. So it's a little bit, I think, like um, you know, a meteor hits the earth. The meteor might have been the size of a bus, but uh, the meteor kind of sends a kind of a radius, a ripples that go out, a blast radius. So it doesn't just impact that spot, but the ripples go out and out and out and impact a whole continent sometimes. And um, Jesus resurrection is like that meteor and as we go back and we look at the epicenter we look at the center where it arrived and we think well what event would have been big enough to cause this kind of blast zone in our world well it seems pretty obvious to me that the only reasonable explanation of what could cause that kind of change in these disciples and start these ripples going out which have impacted our whole world the only reasonable explanation to me seems to be the resurrection of Jesus. Something gave these first believers incredible power and joy and hope, which meant that they would go to their deaths declaring what they had seen. Okay, that was a little bit for the grown-ups. We're back, back together again. So where were we? We had our magnifying glasses out, and we were thinking about the clues that tell us that Jesus is alive. We thought about the appearances of Jesus, we thought about number two, which was the change that happened in his disciples and the change they made to the world. And number three is the one we're thinking about today. So can anyone put a hand up and tell me, maybe on this side actually, what 
we saw in our reading today that convinced, oh, we've, yeah, go on, LV. Yeah, they went to see that, that tomb. And what did they see when they looked inside the tomb? Sorry, I missed the last word. They missed. They saw the entrance. Angel. They saw the angel and that stone was moved out the way. They looked inside. And what, I'm looking for one thing that they saw when they looked inside. Maybe someone else. What did... Oh, I'm sorry. They saw the cloth. So they saw the tomb was empty and all that was there. Do you remember the boys were looking at those cloths? Thank, thank you, Albie. I'm sorry about my hearing. Um, so the th- third strand of the evidence we're thinking about today is the empty tomb. And actually, that is the main focus of the verses that we had. And this is something that we may sometimes forget and, and jump over and look at the others. But this, this is the one we're going to focus on um, now. And the reason... Um, Uh, we're going to spend special attention on it is because one of the messages of those first 10 verses that we're looking at is that the empty tomb was enough on its own to convince John, the the person who's writing this. So do you remember um, Nathan was playing John and he had that light bulb moment when he was in the tomb and all it was was being inside the empty tomb which convinced him. That was all he needed. So if you remember uh, the dramatized reading, it started with Mary, played by Naomi. She came early in the morning to look at the tomb. Um, She had been very sad because she'd watched her king, her saviour, die. She saw him on the cross and it was a terrible moment because she had thought Jesus was someone special. And then all her hopes were dashed and crushed as she saw the life drain out of her hero. And she thought, I must have got it wrong. How could my hero and king die like this but anyway in her sadness she gets up on that Sunday morning she heads to the tomb to pay her respects to this dead king and when she gets there she noticed that that heavy um, stone that big black heavy stone was moved away from the entrance so ordinarily it would be blocking the entrance to the tomb and she started to be a bit puzzled she thought that is odd that stone was definitely there before maybe some robbers have tried to break into the tomb or maybe the leaders the the authorities have have broken in and tried to take the body and so she doesn't quite know what to do it's all a little bit spooky so she runs to get her friends and that's what she did she ran over to get peter and john and she told them do you remember they've taken my lord out of the tomb we don't know where they've laid him so she assumes the body's been stolen and then peter and john come um, and they have this running race And uh, when they get there, um, something convinces them that whatever has happened, the body hasn't been taken. And they used some logic here. They used a bit of uh, detective clues. Because in those days, the point of taking a body, if you're a grave robber, wasn't because the body was precious. That was useless. The point was that the linen cloths were precious because they could be sold on again. Uh, and they saw that the linen cloths were there. And they thought, this is not grey robbers. No grey robber would take a body and leave the cloths. And when they get there, they, um, not only yeah, do they notice those grave clothes, but they realise that it couldn't be, as well, be the leaders. It couldn't be the authorities. Um, if they had wanted uh, to take the body, they wouldn't have taken the time to unwrap it carefully and then fold neatly the grave clothes. They just would have taken it in a hurry and bustled it off. And Peter and John realized that something else must be behind this. And John, who's a little bit of a quicker detective than Peter, he starts to put the pieces of the puzzle together. And we, we read in our verses, didn't we? It was verse 8. John saw, he saw inside the tomb, saw the cloths, and he believed this wonderful kind of light bulb moment he puts it together and he realizes that Jesus is alive so to recap we've been looking at the various clues uh, that show that Jesus was raised we thought about the appearances later in the chapter the difference the change it made to his disciples and how they changed the world 
But specifically, we're seeing as well the empty tomb is a key piece of the puzzle because John only needed that piece to work out the whole mystery. And he worked out from the empty tomb, this is number one, this is number two, he worked out that Jesus really is alive. I just want us to think, those words trip off our tongue very quickly, we know that's what Easter's about, but I want us to think about what an incredible moment that was. Jesus' body lying cold and lifeless in a tomb. And then there was really was one moment like that when his heart, his dead heart, started ba-boom, 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 started beating again. And there really was a moment when his eyes opened and he stood up, he took his first breathful of new air. And that moment has changed the history of the world. And the world has never been the same since then. And the empty tomb is this important bit of uh, evidence for understanding that Jesus really is alive. But it's also a very important bit of evidence for understanding the meaning of Jesus being alive, why it matters. We're going to think about that in a moment. Uh, But first we're going to sing again. And we're going to sing about Jesus, the risen conquering son. Let's stand and sing together. So just to recap, we've been thinking about how the empty tomb tells us Jesus is alive, and now we're thinking about how the empty tomb tells us that the story of this world is going to end well. Now, children, occasionally in the Bible, um, other people have come back from the dead. It's not very often, but occasionally. And in particular, there's um, a very famous one where Jesus calls a man's name. 
And the man responds, and even though he's been in the grave for four days, he comes out. Now, children, do you know? Oh, there's, yeah, yeah, hands up. Who was the person who came out of the grave? Yeah, Ella. Lazarus, exactly right. So if we've been reading through John's gospel, we're in John 20. We would have already covered this in John chapter 11, and it's deliberately um, got various comparison points between John 11 and John 20. It's interesting, isn't it, children, that we only have a Jesus Easter. We don't celebrate Lazarus Easter. So there's something very different, actually, about Lazarus's resurrection and Jesus's and that shows that the Jesus resurrection is much, much more special. So when Lazarus came out of the grave, and I think the children know this story quite well, they actually had to roll the stone away. Um, also, after they, um, Jesus called him out of the tomb, uh, Lazarus was walking around in, in, he looked like Scooby-Doo, you know, at the end of the episode with all the, you know, grave clothes all wrapped out, and somebody actually had to cut it open or unbind him to let him out, whereas we, we're going to see that's not the same with Jesus. And finally, we know in the Lazarus story, the first thing that happens was, well, a lot of people didn't like Jesus bringing a man out of the grave. And so immediately the leaders plot and they try, they, they don't like Jesus, they don't like his popularity, and they decide the solution is they're going to put Lazarus to death. It's a slightly ironic way of dealing with a resurrection, but that's what they try and do. So one of the first things we discover after Lazarus is that death is still very much a very real threat for him. Um, in fact, um, this is one of the great, contrast we're going to see because when Jesus comes out of the tomb they don't need to roll the stone across in fact it's miraculously rolled um, it we discover in another gospel by an angel um, also we discover that they didn't have to cut Jesus through free that was I think one of the, the great things that occurred to perhaps to John uh, when he saw the folded grave clothes this is so different this is even unlike Lazarus's grave clothes incident he didn't need to be uh, unbound. Jesus perhaps even came through his clothes because he appears in a, in a locked room a little bit later on. Um, and finally, um, unlike Lazarus, who was under threat for his life, he had to run away because the leaders were trying to kill him. Jesus comes out of the grave indestructible, never uh, to die again. Um, because for Jesus, it was a very different kind of miracle. So yes, they've got something in common, dead people came out of the grave, but actually they're quite different. And somebody's um, d expressed it a bit like this. When Lazarus died, he went into the tomb and then he was called out of it. And it was like he'd gone into a tunnel, a tunnel called death, and then he came out again. Um, and um, if you think about it, it wasn't really a permanent solution. Eventually, Lazarus was going to have to die again so he'd have to go through that horrible experience once again of having to die and think about his family poor Lazarus's family had to mourn him twice imagine going to his funeral twice that was a terrible thing that family had to endure yet for Jesus it was very different so he went into the tunnel just like Lazarus did but instead of coming out again to die again Jesus punched through he punched through death and got out to the other side. He, he got a new kind of life, resurrection life, a life that will never end and is indestructible. And the difference is very obvious then, isn't it? Because Jesus has beaten death. He's punched a hole right through it. And that is why Jesus' resurrection is so relevant for every human being on this earth. Um, this is why we have Jesus' Easter and not Lazarus' Easter. Jesus' Uh, resurrection impacts all of us. There's one place in the Bible um, in Isaiah 25 where death is described as uh, like a cloth, like a veil, like a sheet. I'm actually going to need a uh, helper now to help me. So we're going to do a visual aid. Um, would somebody like to come up who's good at holding? Um, let me just check if I've missed. We've got, why don't we have Cleo and Jack? Okay, Jack, you're tall. Yeah. Can you hold? <laughs> Not really. Ho hold it up high. Okay, what we're going to do, so uh, in the Bible, um, death is described as like a veil, and it, it traps the human race. We're trapped one side of it. We can't get the other side. 
like the tunnel. We, we, we just go into the grave, we can't get out of it. And yet, what happens with Jesus? You can see, um, Jack, are you insured? Anyway, we've got, a ne- we've got a needle here. And what Jesus does, this is what you've got to do, Cleo. You, you have to make sure that you don't draw blood on him. <laughs> I'm going to hold it as well. And you're, what Jesus does is he's like a needle. And can you push it through? I'm going to hold, hold it taut. T- and you've got to push through. One, two, three. So Jesus is like the needle. He's the first one. Unlike Lazarus who came out again, he pushes right through. Can you put it out the other side? You might have to wiggle it. He goes right through and out the other side. Can you hold it up? So Jesus, unlike anyone else, has gone through the veil of death and out the other side. Now that is very significant because because he's like a needle, it means that if others are tied onto him, you hold it there and I'm going to just, no, I need that end. Hold the middle, that's it. Thanks. Um, now, if I've got a bit of orange thread here. Now, if I tried on my own to push the orange thread through, no chance. You just can't do it. But if it's connected to Jesus, because you want to try again, why don't you go through that same, or even, yeah, let's do that. Go through. Try not to stab anyone. And then... Because Jesus has gone through and out the other side, it means that anybody, any of us who connect ourselves to Jesus, it's relevant for us too because we can be joined to Jesus and we can come out too. Thank you very much. Do you guys want to sit down again? Um, and it's, it's a little picture for us of why Jesus' resurrection is, is unlike Lazarus's, impacts every human being. I want us to imagine something for a moment. We had the, the reading, and we're probably, some of us, quite familiar with the reading. But this, I'm going to change the reading, and you'll see why it matters that it goes the way it does. So imagine the disciples came, Peter and John, they got to the tomb, they looked inside it, and they saw the body of Jesus. And then an, an angel arrives, and he says, don't worry, don't worry, I can, I can see you're looking at the body of Jesus and that he's bound up there, but don't worry, because one, the spirit of Jesus lives on, and one day when you will die, your spirits will live on too, and your spirits will be with Jesus' spirit in heaven, and you'll float around together in this blissful eternity. Now, by that, honestly, that doesn't happen in any of the Gospels, and, and it's what I'm trying to do is emphasize why it's so significant that Jesus' body came out of the grave. Not just because it proves something, because it, because it shows us the meaning of Jesus' resurrection. If the gospel accounts ended like that, oh yeah, there's Jesus' body, but don't worry, what kind of a gospel would we have? And, and actually, the Bible answers that question a bit later in the Bible. One of Jesus' followers, the Apostle Paul, says, if Christ has not been raised bodily, then it's all a waste of time. We have no hope and we deserve to be pitied more than anyone else in the world. That is no gospel at all. If Jesus' body was still there and the angel said, don't worry, you'll be with him spiritually, that's useless. And this is why the empty tomb is so fundamental for understanding what our hope is. It underlines that Christ took a physical a human physical body into death, and Christ brought out of the tomb a physical glorified human body out of the other side of death. And therefore, it it means something. It means that our future, if we're joined to him like that orange bit of thread, our future is going to be like Jesus' future. It's going to be earthy. It's going to be physical, albeit glorified, whatever that means, and we don't know exactly what that means. And what do we see Jesus doing in his glorified body when he comes out of the grave? And if you know the the gospel accounts, he goes on long walks with his friends. He has barbecues on the beach. He goes fishing with his mates. He has tear-filled reunions, hugging his loved ones. And this is the picture of the resurrection life which Jesus invites us into. He does not invite us into some floaty, otherworldly existence. Um, Sometimes people speak, don't they, about what happens when we die as, have you heard this phrase, the afterlife? Um, And there's a a, a Disney film. Does anyone know which film it is? 
Yeah, last one's get strong on this. Soul, I heard. Someone shouted it out. I knew you guys know. This is um, the, the film Soul, and it, um, it tries to show you what lo- they think life like after death might be like. And you can see it's a bit floaty and ethereal, and it's, it actually looks very boring and indistinct. And even from the picture, you can see it doesn't look very exciting. That is not the way Christians talk about the world to come at all. And if anything, I think we should be talking about this life now as the pre-life. How's your pre-life going? You know, this is like the trailer. This is, this is the dress rehearsal of something much better and more glorious, the true full life, the real thing, the main event which is coming after, not just some PS postscript afterlife. Um, so this is much more like where we are headed. It's much more like that than like the Disney equivalent. And um, some of us who are already on the church WhatsApp group that uh, Andrew mentioned, will have seen in the last couple of weeks, there was a lovely um, video that David Britton put on. I think it was two minutes long. And it was a very powerful testimony of how, as a child, he had been terrified of death. This is a little advert. Get on the WhatsApp group after if you're not on. If you, children, if you haven't seen it, maybe ask a grown-up if they will show it to you because you can just watch a two-minute video. And and perhaps, children, you've had similar kinds of experiences to David. David used to explain how when he was a child, he used to be very sad at night time. He used to have lots of fears, lots of worries in his bed. And especially he was worried about death. What's going to happen when I die one day? And and he used to get nightmares about it. And, And in the little video, David explains, and he can tell you more about it, but his mother explained to him what we're thinking about today. His mother explained to him about Jesus, and there is one person who is stronger than death, stronger than any enemy, any worry that we might have in our lives. And David explained the difference that made in his life, because he put his trust in Jesus, and he discovered that ultimate protection is found, not even from our mums and dads or from any human relationship. Those things give us comfort, but the real answer to our worries, our ultimate worries, is knowing the Lord Jesus, the one who has total authority over every enemy we might face. Only in Jesus do we have someone stronger than death. And David spoke so powerfully about that. And discovering this reality in our lives makes such a difference in all kinds of hard times and difficulties that we might go through. And when I was growing up, growing up, I was um, in a church in a village and um, one of the guys in our church was another guy called Andrew. Not everyone in the church was, but it was a good proportion. And um, this guy, Andrew, who was good friends with my dad. Um, Andrew was, um, when he had been born, he had um, something called uh, cerebral palsy. And it meant that life was very hard for him. Um, he couldn't really walk. He, he had two crutches and he could kind of shuffle and drag his feet along. Uh, he, he could talk, but he, his talk was very, his speech was slow. It was slurred. And it was very, actually, very difficult having a conversation with him. Not many people uh, found it easy to, because it, it took a long time to talk to him. Um, and um, the, this guy, Andrew, he was a keen Cambridge United supporter. Uh, he'd put his faith in the Lord Jesus. And the one thing, if you got him talking on it, which would really get his face to light up, was talking about the life to come, the life with Jesus that he was looking forward to. And he would talk about how... Some of the things he was looking forward to, especially, he was looking forward to walking. And he was looking forward to talking and having normal conversation. And especially, he was looking forward to playing football. And he really, really wanted to play centre forward um, for Cambridge United. Um, But he knew that one day, because of the resurrection of Jesus, he would have a strong, glorified resurrection body. And that hope made a huge difference to Andrew and actually helped him get through some very difficult times in his life. It makes a huge difference, whatever we're going through, to know that there's no no problem that we're facing that a good resurrection won't fix. And and we should hang on to that. So we began at the beginning, didn't we, thinking about um, the reason we love stories. I take it we all love stories uh, in different ways. And the reason we love stories is because we are in a story. Our lives are a story. The, the story of the world, the history of the world is a story. And the point I'm trying to make about Easter is Easter makes all the difference because it tells us what kind of a story 
we are in. And um, let me just show you a couple of images as we close to try and express what I'm trying to say. And the first picture here is of two people in a boat. And uh, these are two British people who uh, were out in a boat and it went wrong and they got swept out to sea a long, long way into the Atlantic Ocean. And they couldn't see land. And they'd been kind of spinning around. They, they actually couldn't remember which direction they'd come from. They didn't know, therefore, which direction to try and get towards. Um, and they'd lost all hope. They, they were just despairing in this boat. And they had lost all hope and they were terrified. And one of them said afterwards, this was in the newspaper, we had a complete sense of hopelessness. You can imagine the terrifying reality of being in their situation. Let me show you another picture. Here we have two people almost in the same situation. It's the same size boat, it's the same weather conditions. And actually these two people were even further from land from, and from where they wanted to get to than in the first boat. But their experience of their situation was completely different because this second pair were on a quest. They, they were on a 3,000 mile cross Atlantic row. They were trying to row across the ocean and they knew exactly where they'd come from and they knew exactly where they were heading towards. And they were, it was obviously hard work doing the rowing, but they were full of purpose and grit and determination and they were full of hope and they couldn't wait to get where they were headed and of course many people in our country sadly live their lives a little bit like being in that first boat uh, they don't know where it is that they've come from ultimately speaking they don't know where it is they or, or even the world is heading ultimately speaking and so what they do i guess is they try and distract themselves as best they can uh, but really, if they think about it, they are disoriented and they're without real purpose, without real hope in their lives. And that is why what we are celebrating this morning at Easter time is such good news, not just for us to have a, a warm lift on a Sunday morning, but it's good news for everyone in this world uh, to tell us that the, re the resurrection of Jesus means the history of this world, this earthly existence is going to end well jesus has conquered death he will bring with him through death anyone who will join themselves to him into a new uh, glorified creation with him and this isn't just good news for us it's good news for everyone it means we can live today and every day with hope and with purpose unlike the people on that first boat children you've done very well uh, we're going to um just pause there and we're going to have our prayers and I believe um, there's some Sinclairs who are going to come up and lead us in prayer. So let's children close our eyes and we're going to pray.